Hi guys, this is a scientist amongst us and I'm back with another one. On this episode, I wanted to talk about insulin and glucagon. So when you eat a meal, the carbohydrates in the meal are broken down and the glucose monomers that result are absorbed into your bloodstream. When this happens, your pancreas produces a hormone called insulin. Specifically within the pancreas, there's a group of cells called beta cells, and these are the ones that produce insulin. Insulin is a hormone that tells cells to use the glucose that is in your bloodstream. Your blood sugar has spiked, and the cells can now use that blood sugar to generate energy in the form of ATP, which is almost all biological energy. And, you know, as we talked about in the last episode, the excess glucose can be converted into fat. It can also be converted into large chains of sugars called glycogen. And fat and glycogen are ways of storing energy. So insulin tells the cells in your body to store energy and to produce ATP and remove the glucose from your bloodstream. Without insulin, your blood sugar would constantly increase and increase and increase, and the cells would never take it in, never break it down, and never use it. And as a result, you would get a massive blood sugar spike. And this is quite bad for you. And this is what happens in um, forms of diabetes. In obesity, you can imagine that there is too much insulin. If there's too much insulin, your body will continue to take in that glucose and produce glycogen and fat, and it'll keep on storing all of this energy without ever releasing it. The opposite to insulin, the counter hormone, is a hormone called glucagon. So the pancreas also produces glucagon, and the pancreatic cells that do this are called alpha cells, and glucagon counters the effects of insulin. When glucagon is released and the cells in your body come into contact with glucagon, instead of storing energy, they start releasing it and they also start breaking down their glycogen and fat and producing glucose and elevating your blood sugar. So when your blood sugar goes too low, glucagon is released and it tells the cells to break down their glycogen and break down the fat and produce sugars and release it into the bloodstream. And basically this is one way of burning fat. So you can imagine in obesity, if insulin or glucagon is impaired, this is why you might put on weight and it won't go away. So there's a condition called hyperinsulinemia. Hyperinsulinemia means hyper, that means there's a whole lot. Insulin, which is the hormone we're talking about, and emia means in the blood. So there's too much insulin in the blood. And if there's too much insulin in your blood, all your cells are in storage mode and they keep on storing more and more of this glucose and turning it into fat and turning it into glycogen. And this might be one of the reasons obesity occurs. Now I wanted to get into the biochemical cascades that explain how insulin and glucagon exert their effects on different cell types. For insulin, this is still pretty debated, but I want to give the current model that scientists use to describe how insulin works. It all has to do with glucose transporter protein. Glucose transporter proteins are like these pores that stick into the lipid membrane that's on the outside of cells, and they allow glucose to pass back and forth. If you increase the amount of glucose transporter proteins on the surface of a cell, more glucose will be able to travel within to the cell. In order to do this, the glucose transporter proteins have to be moved from vesicles that are found inside of the cell to the plasma membrane where they can make contact with the blood and take in serum glucose. So there are many steps involved in translocating the glucose transporter proteins from intracellular vesicles to the plasma membrane. To do this, insulin first binds to the insulin receptor protein, which changes shape. And because of the shape change due to binding of insulin, 
tyrosine residues within its structure can turn into phosphotyrosine residues. So phosphotyrosine residues are negatively charged, while tyrosine residues are neutral. As a result of displaying phosphotyrosine residues, the protein also becomes negatively charged, and this allows it to bind to another protein called the insulin receptor substrate. It's actually a, a class of proteins. There's many insulin receptor substrates. But that being said, the insulin receptor, because of the binding of insulin and the formation of phosphotyrosine, is now bound to the IRS, or the insulin receptor substrates. And the insulin receptor substrates then bind to another protein called P13K, or phosphoinositol 3 kinase. Phosphoinositol 3 kinase is now really close to the plasma membrane due to this connection of proteins where it's anchored to the membrane protein, the insulin receptor, which normally hangs out in the membrane. And because it's in the membrane, it can act on its substrate, which is PIP2 or phosphoinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. I'm going to say PIP2 just because that's a mouthful. The reaction of PIP2 and P13K results in PIP3 or phosphoinositol 345-triphosphate. This is a plasma lipid. It's anchored into the membrane just like everything else that we're talking about right now. So this is all happening near the plasma membrane. And because of this new lipid that's in the plasma membrane, another protein, AKT, which binds to PIP3, can also anchor into the membrane. AKT, its reaction involves phosphorylating another protein called TBC1D1. TBC1D1 is a protein that interacts with the vesicles that contain the glucose transporter proteins. It specifically acts on a protein class called RAB-GDP. So RAB-GDP, RAB proteins, are bound to GDP, which is guanosine diphosphate. And AKT turns that guanosine diphosphate into guanosine triphosphate, transforming the RAB protein from RAB-GDP to RAB-GTP. RAB proteins are also sharing the same vesicles where the glucose transporters are found. And because they are docked into this vesicle and they are transformed into RAB-GTP, they are in their activated form. In their activated form, they can bind to what are called effector proteins. And the effector proteins can then bind to what my favorite protein called kinesin. Kinesin is this nanomachine that can literally walk across microtubules, which is kind of like the skeleton of the cell, and they can drag the vesicle behind them. So they have this giant arm that's linked through an effect effector protein to wrap GTP that's in the vesicles, and then they have this walking motion across the microtubule, pulling this vesicle all the way to the plasma membrane, where they can then dock and then these glucose transporters can now come into contact with the blood and allow glucose to flow into the cell. And that's the really long cascade of how insulin makes the glucose transporters translocate to the plasma membrane and allows glucose to come inside the cells so that it can be broken down and turned into fats and turned into ATP and allow the cell to start storing energy. Should be noted, this entire mechanism is still debated. There are so many steps. And if you're wondering why there are so many steps, I think it has to do with feedback loops. So this is a really tightly controlled process. And if the cell needs to basically cut, cut the process and not allow it to happen, there are many steps where you can inhibit any of those steps and it'll cancel the entire process. So it's kind of like a safety, a safety mechanism. And in a future video, I want to talk more about those feedback inhibition, those these feedback loops that allow, allow this um, process to be more tightly controlled. So where insulin will cause cells to take glucose within themselves and store it as glycogen and fat, glucagon will do the opposite. So the glycogen within the cells will be broken down and turned into glucose that then gets re-released back into the bloodstream. In order to do this, there's another complicated biochemical cascade. So glucagon 
binds to the glucagon receptor. Just like insulin bound to the insulin receptor, glucagon has its own receptor, the glucagon receptor. Due to this binding, another protein, adenylate cyclase, is activated. Adenylate cyclase breaks down ATP. Remember, the energy that's used in biology is usually it takes the form of ATP, and adenylate cyclase will break ATP to form what's called cyclic AMP, or adenosine monophosphate, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Cyclic adenosine monophosphate then binds to another protein called protein kinase A, or PKA. This is not to be associated with pHs. PKA is protein kinase A. And in the presence of cyclic AMP, it converts another protein, phosphorylase kinase, or PPK, into phosph it phosphorylates it. It basically takes a phosphate group from ATP, converts ATP to ADP, and adds the phosphate onto phosphor phosphorylase kinase, PPK. This activated phosphorylase kinase then phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase B, which is abbreviated PYGB. Glycogen phosphorylase is the protein that breaks down glycogen and converts it into glucose phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate specifically. And then glucose 1-phosphate is then converted by another protein into glucose and then released into the bloodstream. And that's how glucagon works. So every protein within these biochemical cascades is a target that can be manipulated by a drug, by a pharmaceutical intervention, for example. You can create a drug, for example, theoretically, that'll block P13K. And by blocking P13K, you might be able to shut down the entire insulin cascade. And if you shut down the insulin cascade, you would prevent glucose from going inside the cells and potentially this could be used as an obesity treatment. You can also hit any of the proteins in that entire pathway and potentially have the same effect. And people have tried to do this, and there are clinical trials with drugs to see if this actually works or not. Now, it doesn't only have to be pharmaceutical interventions. Exercise, for example, has an effect on the P13K, AKT, that pathway that we talked about within insulin. And in a future video, I want to talk about that as well. And even in your diet, the foods that you eat, the chemicals found within the food, the compounds that are within the diet that, you, that you're eating, they might also affect these pathways. And that might be a way for diet to affect how obesity occurs through this insulin-mediated mechanism. If you've stayed with me for this long, through this entire video, I thank you for your time. I appreciate you. If you're new to this channel, like, subscribe, share with your friends. I, I love talking about science and I wanna get really deep into the science of obesity and try and understand how obesity occurs and how insulin is related. I'll be back with more content soon. Thank you for your time and don't forget to breathe just like I'm doing right now. Have a wonderful day.